Thank you. A um, couple of weeks ago, I was trying to remember how old I am. True story. Turns out I'm 28. Um, and next I was thinking, well, where will I be 28 years from now, and how will society look like then? Clear signs of a quarter-life crisis. Um, and while you might not be personally interested in my personal growth and development plans for the next 28 years, I think 28 years from now is actually an interesting time for all of us as we will be in 2051, a year into when we should have achieved net zero. At least that goal was set in the 90s with the Kyoto Protocol, and since then, the trend in reducing carbon emissions has been very clear, stability. <laughs> Let's make you feel good for a moment. Here's the same chart for the UK. Clearly downwards trend, we're doing something right. I did say just a moment, because if we look at manufacturing in the UK, we see the same trend. So if you ever wondered what the most effective way was to reduce your carbon emissions, simply ship them overseas. Added benefit, we get to point the fingers at others while feeling really good about ourselves. And this is not an anecdotal point, right? The government's website talks about carbon emissions from industry reduction as the main driver. So why is it that there has been very little progress so far? Well, I think a core point is what people associate with climate change. And this wouldn't be a technology talk these days if I didn't use ChatGPT. So I did ask that question to ChatGPT. And here's the answer. Polar bears. This would, in fact, also be my answer. This is the image I grew up with for climate change. Right? But it's not a pretty strong case if you try to get people to act, if your biggest argument are endangered species. Now, when I ask the same question to younger people already, they have a different answer. Right? They talk about forest fires, droughts, and climate refugees. And this should hopefully already be a much stronger case. But instead of trying to figure out how we stop the problem that leads to migration, the discussion ends up about how we stop the people from crossing the channel. In all of those cases, it seems like climate change is a problem far away, right? either at the poles, at the equator, or down in the future. So a problem for the next generation. So sustainable actions are actually seen as charitable actions. And charity is not a good motivator. So I could spend all afternoon explaining why sustainability it's not a problem of the future, but very much of the present day, and why it's not a problem far away, but very much happening here. But I only have 15 minutes, so I would like to start with the premise that climate change is a fact. Another reason I don't want to focus on the future too much and paint doomsday picture is because fear is also a bad motivator, as it freezes us from taking actions. So let me try to cheer you up, and nothing better to do that than to dwell on the past, so let's look back 28 years, 1994, according to my parents, a great year. <laughs> um, Windows NT had just hit the market, right? But for many households, they wouldn't have a computer for years to come. But within just a couple of years, games changed from this to that. And for people who don't uh, recognize it, this is Lara Croft, a woman who spends her time running around in, uh, nature, personal hero, hashtag life goals. Um, and this game already seems so realistic that when my brother pressed the right button to make Lara crawl, I hunched on myself because I felt like the walls were real. A couple years later again, this iconic moment happened, the first iPhone hit the market, and now we have a supercomputer in our pockets compared to the 90s. Obviously, technology hasn't stopped, and with the rise of AI, it has just become unreal to the point where now we can do things like this. I thought man-made climate change was just fake news. If you're confused about the past tense in the sentence, suggesting that he changed his opinion, it's because of deep fake, right? A video created by AI. And while compared to the previous examples of the other talks, this is a bit of a ridiculous example, I just want to illustrate how much we have come, right? Both this video and Lara Croft artificially created graphics. It is 20 years apart. And the reason I like to look at tech for hope is not only that I think it will play a key part in solving climate uh, issues, but the exponential development of technology itself. Right? The reason we now have a computer in our hands 900 million times more powerful than the US had to put a man on the moon is because of a phenomenon named after this fellow, Gordon Moore, who in the 70s predicted 
that the number of transistors, so the smallest computational resource in your computer, would double every year. And the reason I uh, think this is hopeful is because this development is not just limited to technology, but rather all parts of human development, whether we look at life expectancy, literacy, or world population. And importantly, all those graphs have a uh, uh, low effort at the beginning, right? We have a very slow start, similar to our efforts in reducing carbon emissions. So there clearly is still hope, but just sitting, waiting, and hoping for things to change can't be the answer either. Right? Even if the, um, politicians nowadays say that all we need to do is to invest in technology. As an engineer myself, I'd like to thank you for your trust, but please do your homework as well, because hope is also a bad motivator, as it doesn't require us to take actions. So now I've spent a fair amount of time talking about all the things that don't seem to work. <laughs> so what can we do? Well, let's look at how people actually change their behaviors. Simply put, we act as agents in an environment. And our actions change the state of the environment, which we then perceive, and then get reward for that. And based on the reward, we change our actions to get reward more and more. And that's why you often hear things like the market will regulate itself. But when it comes to climate change, this does not work. And to understand why, we need to look at what we need for the system to work. First of all, we need low cost of action, right? We're lazy people, minimal effort, better. Secondly, we need a high reward, which at least needs to be higher than the cost of action for us to make sense to take that action. And finally, the time that lapses between taking action and getting the reward needs to be short, because we've got short memories and are really bad at delaying gratification. Just think of the last time you found five pounds in your pocket you forgot you put there, right? You don't think about the bad action of having put it somewhere where you almost lost it. All you think about is that this morning, you put on your trousers like most mornings, and you found five pounds. <laughs> this is a great cost to reward ratio. The problem with climate change is that none of those points actually hit, right? First of all, the action are usually quite high and seen as sacrifice. Secondly, the change of state is very slow and indirect, so we don't even understand how our action changed the states. And finally, the reward is basically zero, as we don't personally benefit from reducing our carbon emissions. Now, the current effort is on making sustainability affordable through grants for electric cars, and insulation, for example. But to have an actual impact, we need to make sustainability lucrative. Right? We need to find ways to reward immediately positive sustainable actions and thus short-circuit the reward cycle. And this should actually be fairly easy, because if we think about what sustainability actually means, it's not about carbon emissions, it's about reducing energy, reducing material, reducing waste. And all of those things mean saving money, which in itself should be rewarding. The problem with sustainability is that it usually takes investment, right? And so while it might pay off at some point, we need to wait, and this means, again, delayed gratification. So whether as businesses or politicians, we need to rethink how we sell sustainability. This means focusing on our business models and particularly focusing on circular business models. So we can take inspiration from software. Software these days is sold as software as a service. This means instead of buying a perpetual license, we have a monthly subscription, which means a lower cost up front and therefore also more users. The equivalent in the hardware world would be product as a service. So how can we do it as businesses? Well, a couple years ago, when I started my PhD, I decided for once in my life I would focus on only on one thing. This feeling lasted for about a month, and then I wanted to also fix global waste problem. Obviously failed so far, <laughs> but... We got to develop this beauty. <laughs> I'm like a proud parent on uh, social media at the moment, <laughs> showing it to everybody. This um, does not yet make any fancy music, we should talk, Simon, <laughs> but it sorts your waste, right? It sorts your waste automatically with AI, and so businesses using this kind of waste bin, like airports or train stations, can increase their recycling rates. So clearly, 
we already have a sustainable impact. Check. But from the beginning, and now it goes against my grain as an engineer, it was clear to me that it's not about whether we can find a technological solution. If we can't sell it, if we can't get it out there, then the actual impact is zero. So we thought of it as a puzzle. How can we solve that? How can we take, get people to actually come to us? And the solution was, instead of having a high fixed price, which most businesses couldn't afford, rather go for a monthly service fee, which in itself is lower than the savings uh, businesses make by improving their recycling rates. So not only do they not have uh, upfront investment they couldn't afford, but they actually save money from day one. OK, so let's take this a bit further. Because we're interested in the monthly solution fee, we're actually interested also in a long product life, right? Because we don't try to get bins out there all the time. But that also means that we have to re uh, produce fewer bins, which in the manufacturing also means less energy, less material, and less waste. So the benefit to the environment is double. Now you might say, hang on, Jonathan. If there's such a low upfront cost, what stops customers from changing uh, to another business? That's a fair point. But when that is actually another reason why software as a service has taken off. So prior to switching to that business model, Adobe had to wait for long periods of time before they would release a new version. Because otherwise, users would wait for the next version afterwards to get more for the same money. Now that they're subscribed, they can introduce new features all the time. So when we thought about the design, we thought, okay, how can we also introduce that in our features, right? So this bin is basically like an IKEA bed. You can take it apart in every single part. So whether it is broken and you fix it, or whether you just want to introduce a new feature, you take out the old part, put in the new feature, and the customer can continue to be happy, while again, having less energy, less material, and less waste. And finally, it's important to understand that this is not just the customer benefits, right? Adobe didn't switch to that business model out of the good of their hearts, right? F because of the my subscription fee, it also means higher profits, and it's easier to acquire customers. Because speaking from my experience, it's much easier coming into a place and saying, hey, how would you like if we replace your bins for free and save you 100,000 pounds in the uh, meantime, rather than going, do you would you like to, have, uh, would you like to buy bins for 500,000 pounds and have a stand-up impact. So lastly, I would like to focus also on politics, because this idea of rethinking about how we get sustainability out there is not limited to businesses. Right? Politicians also need to think about how they sell sustainable policies. And I understand this is the end of a long afternoon, but I'd like you to participate. I don't see you guys. You can participate mentally or physically by raising a hand. Let's try to get that. So let's just focus on one thing today um, and fix that. Uh, the biggest carbon emitter in the UK is energy consumption in private houses, specifically heating houses. So who here would spend their Sunday afternoon, for example, to fill out some forms, to then get an interest-free loan from the uh, government, then organize builders themselves, then insulate their home to have a sustainable impact, and then hopefully save on energy bills five to 10 years from now? Actually, if you don't take that up, you're uh, throwing away money because that interest-free loan in modern days is actually free money. But if you're interested, this uh, scheme already exists, but doesn't get the uptake. Now, let's rethink that and think about who would fill out the same amount of forms to then get builders sent around and save money on the bills from day one. Right? This is already far more attractive, and you get rewarded immediately. But we need to take that even further. Um, so basically, this is the same scale as before, because if you look at installation costs versus the yearly savings, if we repay that over five years, we could already save 400 pounds, right? So it's the same scheme, just reward differently. But let's take it even further, um, because we need to lower the cost of action further. There needs to be a default option for builders, for example, vetted by the government, so again, that the cost of action for the citizen is lower to begin with. And how much better would it be if instead of repaying the loan through a bank, 
That's with the energy bill, right? We see the original cost, we see the updated cost, we see the installation fee, so it's the repayment of the loan, and we immediately see the reward we get for sustainable actions. This is how we actually incentivize people uh, to take sustainable actions. But obviously, interest-free loans are a gift, and that's a kind of a critique point from people who don't want us to act against uh, uh, climate change. But even at an interest uh, rate, as long as the repayment period is long enough, we can save money from day one, right? At 5%, in this case, it would be 250 pounds. At the same time, the government invests for the next generation, so it doesn't lose money. The citizens save money from day one, the society reduces carbon emissions, and the houses increase in value. Now, I understand that we can't solve all the problems in climate change that way. But as leaders in politics or business, we need to rethink how we can short circuit the reward so that we can get more people on board and get grow our support across society. And the answer is not charity, fear, or hope. What we need to realize is that sustainable choices are, in fact, smart financial choices. And then I think 28 years from now, we might just hit our targets. Thank you for your time.